Okay, so there's lots of bits of this talk, which I hope um, I'll explain clearly enough, and I hope you'll explain how they all fit together. Okay, so the various bits are layering, um, then double diffusive convection, um, and double diffusive layering. By double diffusive, I mean something like heat salt thermohaline convection. Then I'm going to talk about magnetic buoyancy, which you may not have come across um, in a particular system. I'm going to talk about it in that system so that I can turn it into thermohaline convection. Thermohaline convection is something people have been studying for many years, as indeed as magnetic buoyancy. But thermohaline convection is like the um, archetypal double diffusive problem. Whereas magnetic buoyancy, as we'll see, is a bit more wacky double diffusive problem. Um, then I'm going to talk about magnetic layering through the thermohaline analogy. Um, and then I'm going to say why it might be important in astrophysics. Okay, so there's all sorts of bits. And I'll try and tie them together. So what do I mean by layering? So layering or, or staircase formation, as it's sometimes or is just um, spontaneous formation of stepped structures, typically in the density or something. It doesn't have to be the density. Um, and it occurs in all sorts of places. And they may or may not be connected. Um, so we had a KITP program on this last year. Um, fortunately, online, um, with people from all lots of different areas looking at who had expertise in layering from lots of different areas to try and work out you know, common ground, as it were. So one of the classic problems or examples of layering is uh, Jupiter's zonal jets, which is a, which you can think of as a staircase in potential vorticity. In terms of um, fusion plasmas, um, there's what's called the E cross B staircase, which is a shear flow staircase. This one is uh, very important because once, if you have layering, then transport properties are very different to unlayered states. So you can imagine in a, in a fusion, nuclear fusion reactor, transport is crucial. Radial transport, um, you might not want it. And so whether you have a layered state or not, um, very important. Um, and the one I'm going to talk about mainly is double diffusion. So just to remind you or if you don't know about it, what double diffusion is. So double diffusion is when you have two components contributing to the buoyancy. And the, the standard one is heat and salt. Okay, like you get in the oceans. Um, and they diffuse, they must diffuse at different rates to get this phenomena. Okay, so in, if you are talking about heat and salt, the ratio is about um, about 100 or 100. Salt diffuses much more slowly than heat. Um, we'll discuss the implications of this in a minute. Uh, that doesn't have to be heat and salt. In stars, it can be uh, heat grade, temperature gradients and composition gradients. Okay. Um, and it can be magnetic fields, and that's what we're going to be talking about later. And the instability of this system can either be steady or it can be oscillatory. And there's two classic regimes in double diffusion. One is what's called salt fingering. So salt fingering, this one way of Temperature is stabilizing and the salinity is destabilizing. Okay, so you can think of that as hot, salty fluid on top of cold, fresh fluid. And if you have that instability, it's, it's direct, steady, or you can have it the other way around, cold, fresh, above hot, salty, and that's an oscillatory instability. So this is, this is what people call the diffusive regime if they're in oceanography. It's what they call semi-convection if they're in astrophysics. But it's the same. Actually, this is what I'm going to be discussing later. 
So double diffusive layering, this is what it looks like. So you can get layering uh, in both of these regimes, in the, uh, in the salt fingering regime and in the diffusive regime. And they're observed, not, they're really observed, not just simulations, but in reality. So um, where you might get hot salty fluid on top is in where places where it's sunny, Okay, so like the Mediterranean, for example, water's hot on the top because the sun, and also it's salty on the top okay, because of evaporation. So you get salt fingering, uh, that regime in, in typically warmer seas, and people have observed layers, um, long lasting actually, and very robust layers. Um, or you can get them in the diffusive regime, such as in the Arctic, where everything's the other way around, colder on the top, um, and actually saltier uh, underneath. And also, they put probes down and measure these things for many months, and they're very robust features. Uh, so you can get them in simulations. This is a simulation <laughs> in Santa Cruz. It's not. It's not quite the, the uh, heat and salt of water parameters. It's because this ratio is only a third. That number is about right, but you can see. So what, what is being shown here is the temperature fluctuations. Um, so you kick it off somehow, we'll talk about that, and you get, at the beginning, you just get sort of homogeneous turbulence. And then over a long time, you get these beautiful layers. So the density at this temperature and the salt and the density at this last stage would be um, a stepped structure. Okay. Fairly, fairly uniform, then a big jump. Um, and this is a similar calculation, much smaller fusivity uh, ratios. This is the um, in the diffusive regime get something similar. <coughs> right, so what are we going to talk about? So magnetic layering. So instability is driven by this thing, magnetic buoyancy, which I haven't explained yet, can also be considered as double diffusive. I'm a, so my plan is to convince you that you can uh, turn magnetic, the magnetic system into double dif a double diffusive system. And then it's bound to have layering in a way, because we've just seen that the double diffusive system has layering. Um, so that's, that was the game. Um, and why are we bothered? Well, as I said, because transport, transport of heat or magnetic fields, salt in that case in the oceans, is hugely affected if you have layers. So you need to know the transport. So if you're doing a stellar model, example you can't solve the equations fully to determine what's happening in, in the star you have to parameterize the transport of heat and transport of everything so you need to know what that transport is and if it's layered or non-layered that number is extremely different um, a bit i think i've already said <coughs> I won't say too much about because I don't really know the answer, either it seems to anybody else, is what is really going on in double diffusive layering? Okay. This, is a, this is an unusual phenomenon in a way. Right? You might think you've got some instabilities, everything gets mixed up. That's your lot, some fairly homogeneous state. So why should layers emerge from these systems? So in terms of the uh, thermohaline problem, people have been putting forward um, different mechanisms for many years. Okay, so I think the first one was Melvin Stern back in the 60s. He talked about what he called collective instabilities, which is a sort of long wave instability of lots of salt fingers. 
which does exist, but it's not clear that it, it turns into layers. Um, you could argue that they're just very different nonlinear states. If you kick it into layers, it will stay there. Okay. Um, this one is certainly true in some sense. I mean, that in the oceans, of course, you get intrusions. So you get hot, you know, you, you can get a layer formed, as it were, from an intrusion. But in the simulations, there are no intrusions. In the simulation, everything is homogeneous, horizontal. So although that might be a relevant uh, factor, it's not, it's certainly not the be all and end all. You get layers without that. Um, sort of mean field instability of the homogeneous state. Um, that much is undeniable. The proponents of this would argue that that's what caused layers. There's a big gap between uh, saying there is a mean field instability and it causes layers. Okay. And I don't think that gap has been filled, particularly. My own preference, the best models in my view for this for, for layering are these are uh, okay so back in the 70s phillips he looked at a different he looked at another layering system which again is unusual so you you have a, a tank of stratified flood uh, fluid not double diffused just stratified and you stir it and you might think well surely it all mixes it doesn't just mix it uh, it forms layers staircases and he put forward why that might be. He put forward the idea of why you might have negative diffusion. Right? You can think of this as negative diffusion in a way. It's sharpening rather than spreading. Um, and he showed that if you have a particular relation between the flux and the gradient, the buoyancy gradient and the flux, then that can lead to negative diffusion. And that's, that's as far as he went. So negative diffusion of itself, of course, is ill-posed. You just have the diffusion problem with a negative coefficient. You're just steepen forever. Then there was a very nice paper um, in 98 by um, Bonfour, Bonfour, Wellen, Smith, and Young. And they kind of extended Phillips' mechanism into a plausible sort of k-epsilon sort of model buoyancy and energy to show how this could happen. Um, and that's, there's quite a lot of work on similar models. Paparella and von Hardenberg have done that. That's soul fingers, sort of. Um, or Pushino is looking at that. Um, with me and Sam. Um, so that I personally, I think this is the best. Um, so we do have some ideas. And I think the mechanism lies here. Okay, some equations. Definitely. Um, so these are the equations, and in a way, these are the equations that we're going to solve. Even when I'm doing the magnetic problem, I'm going to solve the thermohaline problem. I'm going to keep drawing on this analogy between the magnetic problem, which I haven't said about. Introduced yet, and the thermohaline problem. Okay, so these are the classical equations of thermohaline convection. Um, they're made 2D for a reason. I'll explain in a minute. Okay, so there's a 2D flow, incompressible flow. So just like in, in Rayleigh Bernard convection, you have a in Rayleigh Bernard convection, you have a vorticity equation and a temperature equation. Here you also have the salt equation. So this is the vorticity equation. Two bits to the buoyancy. Okay. So this is from the temperature gradient, and this is from the salt. So you have two Rayleigh numbers, and you have an advection diffusion equation for heat and salt. So there's four parameters. So if it were just normal Rayleigh Bernard convection, you'd have a Rayleigh number and a Drantle number. You'd also have a salt Rayleigh number. And the ratio of diffusivity. Okay. Uh, with this convention, but it's not, it's not um, 
universal books, you'll find the, this one is universal. This one is not. With this convention, the positive Rayleigh number is thermally destabilizing, of course, just like in conversion. As I've got it here with this sign, positive salt Rayleigh number is solutely stabilizing. Okay. So this is what the stability diagram looks like in Rayleigh number, salt Rayleigh number space. So thermal, thermally destabilizing is this. Rayleigh number positive is hot underneath cold. And solutely destabilizing is negative R. Bottom right, the fourth quadrant, both, both gradients are stable. And the top, the second quadrant, both gradients are unstable. Salt fingers down here, and if you sit into the wall, here. Okay. Okay. I should have said. This is, we have some, this is as if you've posed the problem between two layers. That the part D, D occurs here. Now, when you're modeling the ocean or the sun, you might think you don't really, you're not too fussed about having really boundaries top and bottom. Um, and, and so you might want to get rid of them. So you can get rid of them by being periodic in the vertical, in the perturbation, not in the background state. The background state is linear in temperature and salt, but you allow per, um, periodic solutions in the vertical. Then you've lost your length scale. There's no D anymore. You have to reintroduce a length scale, which is this one. This is a length. This. So you can you can do the same problem on an unbounded domain. Um, and the equations you get are these. You'll note that ostensibly it looks like we've lost a parameter. Which is on some sense of the same so we have the density ratio, which is the ratio of Rayleigh number to salt Rayleigh numbers, the Prandtl number and the diffusivity ratio. So now we've got a three parameter problem, kind of. Uh, and you can do this in lots of ways. So as we've done it here, we've made the density ratio positive by choice, modular signs, in which case the signs of the gradients live here. If you don't do that, in my view, you get into a tangle because you could you could have the density ratio as without the modulus signs, but then it's the same density ratio in the first and third quadrants, of course, and so that leads to confusion. So these are actually what we're really going to solve. These are skewed. Right. So that's thermohaline convection. We're going to study magnetic buoyancy instability. I'm about to explain and turn it into thermohaline convection. So magnetic buoyancy instability is <coughs> instability of a, in the simplest form, the instability of a horizontal field that varies with depth. Okay. Uh, first introduced in a very nice paper by Newcomb, 1961, purely Theoretical paper in a way, it didn't wasn't motivated astrophysically or anything. But he, he used the energy principle, Bernstein and Sal. Very nice paper. Parker introduced it or reintroduced it um, in an astrophysical context in '66, and he was bothered about uh, the clumping of the interstellar medium. So he wants he was looking at interstellar space with a magnetic field. Could that become unstable? To, Use clumping. Often nowadays, it's it's used to invoke the 
escape of magnetic fields from the, <coughs> let's say, the inside of the sun. So what is it? Well, what it is really is that if you've got a magnetic field which um, decreases with height, then the magnetic pressure is taking some of the burden. Okay. So that's the gas pressure. And that gives you some energy available. And so you, you can get this through a sort of standard parcel argument, if you like. This is like the Schwarzschild criteria modified. Okay. This is 2D. Everything I'm going to talk about is 2D. 2D in this context means the field lines don't bend. That's why B comes with B over O. There are the 3D instabilities, and, uh, and that's a whole different ball game. Um, so roughly speaking, you get instability if the uh, magnetic field P over O decreases sufficiently. And that, of course, has no diffusion in. You might be thinking he's, he's going to turn it into double diffusion and he's given us something which has no diffusion. That is also true. Okay. So this magnetic buoyancy is of itself an instability even without diffusion. <laughs> so magnetic buoyancy is in a way way more complicated than thermo it's compressible right so you need it's a gas so you need the entropy equation as well to go along with it so at first glance it doesn't look as if it these two systems should be the same however you can describe magnetic buoyancy under lots of different approximations in particular the analastic approximation and the zanesque approximation just like you can with normal convection um, that is quite a complicated and quite interesting topic, which I'm not really going to go into too much. Um, I'm going to say, talk about how you can get magnetic buoyancy into a Poussinesque approximation. Um, I'm only going to touch on that also, just to get the right equation. So the boost, to get magnetic buoyancy into a Poussinesque approximation, it's a sneaky business. It requires uh, an assumption about the wave motion, the length scale of the motion along the field, in particular this, the length scale along the motion squared should be greater than a magnetic scale height times a density scale height, and it requires these two small parameters, which, you know, these are standard two small parameters of Boussinesque. Now, depending on the size of these and this, you can get lots of different systems of equations. So, um, there's quite a lot of work over the years on this. So recently, um, Frederick and Harry and I have been looking at this. So it turns out there are five, five systems, five self asymptotically self-consistent systems that that follow from various assumptions, uh, two analastic and three Boussinesque. Um, and that is quite complicated. I'm not going to go into it all. One thing I will just say, though, is why, why isn't magnetic buoyancy in the Boussinesque equations as people normally write them down? If you've ever done any Boussinesque magneto convection, you'll have looked at the classic works of Sandra Seiko or Dyson Proctor or something. And there is no magnetic buoyancy in those equations. And it's never discussed why there is no magnetic buoyancy in those equations, really. So you might ask, why is that? Or you could ask the other question, which is how do I get magnetic buoyancy into the Boussinesque approximation? So Boussinesque magnetic convection actually requires these assumptions. The, uh, the length scale is small. The layer depth is small compared to the pressure scale height, but the magnetic scale height and the perturbations of the, along the field are of the same size as the layer depth. And a huge plasma beta, absolutely huge plasma beta. Under those assumptions, 
the magnetic pressure is small and the gas pressure is small. They are both small. Okay. And so density variations only rely on temperature variations. And it's just like it's just like the Boussinesque approximation with a field. There's no that's all the field just comes into the the, uh, the tension term, the momentum term. It doesn't, there's no kind of thermodynamic implications. But there could be. Instead of those assumptions, take these assumptions. This one the same, but these long scales along the field, and that the magnetic field scale height is also huge. And that the plasma beta, though huge, is not nearly as huge as it was in the Boussin S case. Plasma beta is only epsilon one over epsilon two. So you must have this ordering given the Malphane waves. So you're in a different, you're in a different regime. Um, it's another perfect regime, but it's a different regime. In this regime, the total pressure variation is small. But the magnetic pressure variation and the gas pressure variation are of themselves not tiny. They add together to be tiny. So the gas pressure looks more or less like minus the magnetic pressure. So density variations come both from temperature and pressure or magnetic pressure variations. And that's what magnetic buoyancy is. So under these, under these assumptions, you get magnetic buoyancy into the Boussinesque equations. And having done that, the equations look like this, kind of on the way to being um, a halide, right? We have a vorticity equation, with the temperature term and the magnetic pressure term. We have a magnetic pressure variation, perturbation equation, which looks just like the salt. And then we have uh, this equation, uh, which is a combination of temperature and magnetic pressure. Beta is the subadiabatic temperature gradient. You might be wondering, so this, where do we get this from, the magnetic pressure variation? Well, from dotting the induction equation with the right, magnetic pressure. So you might be wondering why on earth do we have a row in there? So there is no row in the induction equation. So this is a subtle point. This is the div u. Div u by itself is zero in the mass conservation equation. But div u is only small. And its smallness is such that you have to, you have to bring it into the induction equation. In the induction equation, there's a term which is, you know, div u. That really is something to do with density scale heights, right? Through the mass conservation equation. That's where that. Well, that's the that. that comes from. So, if we wanted to, we could turn these to double to an A line convection with some sort of transformation. And the transformation is not. Quite obvious. I mean, if it were well, mathematically obvious, it's, it's not physically obvious, which is why you get interesting differences between the two systems. So, roughly speaking, salt becomes minus magnetic pressure. Okay. This is magnetic pressure in the magnetic problem, and S is salt. So, minus salt becomes magnetic pressure. But temperature uh, in the so the haline problem does not become temperature in the magnetic problem. It becomes a combination of temperature and magnetic pressure. Okay. So that's why it becomes more sneaky. And I'll show you what, how it becomes sneaky in just a minute. So you could define, you know, you could define mathematically, you can definitely turn one to the other, right, through these transformations. No doubt about it. Um, now you could say those are weak, yeah, those are a bit unusual variables. Well, there's two things. You might say those are the natural variables. Depends how you think of these things. Um, you might say that the canonical problem is double diffusive convection. 
that therefore the natural variables are these weird combinations. That is a perfectly acceptable viewpoint. You might, on the other hand, say but there are other ways I could think of it, which is in terms of what another way of thinking of natural variables for the magnetic problem, natural gradients, which is the adiabatic, sub adiabatic gradient and the B over rho gradient. They are, in some sense, the natural ones for the magnetic problem, rather than some wacky combination of the two. If that is your viewpoint, this is, this is how the salt and the haline gradient numbers relate to the magnetic gradient okay. So now you can think, right, I had that diagram with the stability boundaries. What does that look like if I map to the new Rayleigh numbers, well, it looks like this. So this is just the same. This the equation of the of the salt fingers, which is now like magnetic fingers. That's exactly the same. Okay. And the weird one, of course, is this one. It's particularly weird because it cuts into what naively you would think is the stable stable quadrant. Right, the fourth quadrant, the thermohaline convection is absolutely stable. How could it not be? Because the fourth quadrant is uh, cold, salty, underneath, hot, fresh. No way you're going to get an instability out of that. The fourth quadrant here is in some sense stable, stable also, uh, but it's unstable. And it's unstable provided satisfied with absolute. Diffusivity ratio e to over kappa and Prandtl number that is manifestly satisfied astrophysically. Um, what's going on, of course, is that in the thermohaline convection, heat and salt are essentially independent. You can pile up salt somewhere, but it doesn't have an effect on the temperature. But in the magnetic problem, that's not true. If you have a blob which is, enters a region of strong field, it will become squished by the field. Okay, and that will have an effect on its temperature. That's what's going on. That's how you can explain what's happening in this quadrant. And that quadrant has been explored before, but not in terms of layering. Okay. So just to recap where we are, thermohaline convection, magnetic buoyancy, they're sort of the same. If you map one to the other, they're, they're sort of different through this diagram. What we're interested in is, well, can we get layered solutions over here? In particular, can you get layered solutions here? Because this is a very weird region in the magnetic problem. You might say it's not really weird. This is what my co-author always says. He would say it's not really weird because if I map it back into the thermohaline problem, it's, it's lost all its weirdness. That is also a way of looking. In terms of the, the natural gradient, I would call the natural gradients the magnetic problem. It is a weird. So can you get layered solutions? Well, these are just more equations, aren't they? I mean, they're the same. Sorry, they're the same equations. Do we? I don't think they're the same. So you could either think of it in terms, yeah. Oh, sorry, these are the unbounded domains. So just as we could the thermohaline convection, we could turn it into an unbounded domain. So we can. So what are we going to do? So you might think we wouldn't have to do any work whatsoever. We could just take some of these guys' thermohaline problems and do this transformation. Say so they've got layers, we've got layers, and write the paper, which we could have done, except the ones that we wanted weren't in where we wanted them. So we. No one, no one had simulations uh, nice small values of sigma and tor. Sigma is the Prandtl number, tor is eta, the magnetic diffusion, divided by the thermal diffusion. We did nonlinear simulations, 2D. Oh, yes. The analogy is strictly 2D. Right? The analogy between thermohaline convection Magnetic points is strictly two dimensional. The field has to be dead straight. Once the field is not straight, well, then you've got the Lorentz force, you've got the tension, not just the magnetic pressure. 
So these are 2D uh, simulations. We actually solved the thermohaline problem because the equations are nicer in some sense. Right now, there's a chance of getting wrong. Um, and then we turn them back to the kinetic problem. The fourth quadrant, well, the fourth quadrant just satisfies this, is R naught is the density ratio. So we're going to consider two cases. This one lies in the first quadrant, the RB, RT plane, and this one is in the weird region in the fourth quadrant. As I said here, in terms of the thermohaline problem, they're both in the first quadrant. So there's nothing too different between them. In terms of the magnetic problem, they're very different in that one is in the first quadrant, where that one gradient is unstable and one is stable. Good. And, and one in the second in the fourth, the other in the fourth quadrant, where both gradients are in some sense stable. I'll okay. just ask, what's the, the, the new parameter regime versus the diffusive simulations that they've done? Is it the, front, is it the, the sigma and tau being so small in yes. that regime? Okay, thanks. Okay, it's, they might have some like, uh, like the Santa Cruz people, yeah. but they're so, not for such long times and not as. Okay, okay, they've done 3D, so yeah. clearly they can't go on for so long and in such resolution. Okay, that's good. But we could have. Yeah. We wanted, you want all the data, so we couldn't really just take someone to map it. But mainly, it's, there aren't many at such small values of sigma. And, well, two things actually small values of this and large values of this. Right. Yeah. Four being a large value in this context. The, the bigger this number, yeah. That's good. Bigger this inverse number, the bigger this parameter, the further you are away from the neutral line. So most simulations find layering where close to R equals RS, if you like. This one is moving away from that. We solve. We just turn one into the other, but I think I've said all of that. Um, so we solve thermohaline problem. Salt. Of course, the magnetic problem is even more. It's more com convoluted. It's not quite right, isn't it? But the, the thermohaline convection problem is very straightforward. You've got perturbations in temperature and salt, and you're bothered about temperature and salt gradients. In the magneto boussinesque equations, gradients in entropy and P over rho, but you bothered about perturbations in magnetic pressure and entropy. So you have to use problems which can be surmounted on this. Okay, so this is if you were lost in any of that, you can start again now. So we've got a, a box, yeah. 2D box, uh, periodic boundary conditions in the perturbations, horizontal and the vertical. So this is the early time evolution of the kinetic energy. So since we're in the diffusive regime, the initial instability is oscillatory. Okay. Oh, well, I should also say, in this, once you allow yourself periodic boundary conditions on the vertical, you can, the most unstable mode has no vertical structure. Okay, the most unstable mode is, is a so-called elevator mode, right? It's, it's, it's up next to something down, which of course you can't have if you've got rigid boundaries. Even more, that is a perfectly good non-linear solution, right? Because there's no, there's no u dot grad u anybody in that equation, in that, in that solution. So actually the elevator solution is a solution of the full nonlinear equations, which will grow without bound. Fortunately, in some sense, it itself, it itself is unstable. What's happening here? 
So there is there is a nonlinear solution where this just carries on forever. But of course it is. Yeah. It, it's unstable and it's unstable to these guys, which I put in just because it's sort of pretty. Um, it's a long way from the layering, as we'll see. So these are the, this is the instability of the initial elevator solution. which is an interesting problem of itself. Um, the basic state, of course, is periodic. There's some interesting flow plate analysis that can be done here. So Stephen and I had a student, Thomas. And this is what happens after that instability has had its say. Okay. It's a kind of well-mixed state. So the top three panels are vorticity, temperature, and salt. The bottom three panels are vorticity, entropy, perturbation, and pressure perturbation. So these are what actually come out of this solution. These are what we get in the transformation. Okay. And the long term, oh, I'm sorry. So at this stage, these are the profiles, the mean, so those are the perturbations. These are the total profiles with the background state and the perturbation. So there's not, there's no great variation from the initial bit, right? Weekly, that's about it. Nothing at this stage to suggest layers. So this is the evolution, long-term evolution. So the, what we've just seen is way down here up to 500. The kinetic energy just grows as this system evolves. We'll see how this, we'll see how this, oh, and everything changes as we go along. So these three dashed lines, these are just points I'm going to show you pictures from at these times. Right, so this, okay, going back to this, so this is, this next one is the one that first just, Okay. So you can see this is the first state state time at which staircases emerge that you're happier staircases. So you can see these bands of heat and salt perturbation. Um, actually, so this one, so salt and magnetic pressure are the same. Remember? to a sign. Neg negative salt is, is positive. This one is more complicated. This one, of course, is a combination of these two. So it's not quite as so clear as that one, I would say. And then what happens as time goes on is that these merge. So this is always seen. So this is an interesting question. Whatever all these simulations, any double diffusive system, however many layers you get, long-term evolution is just layer merger. Till in the end, you're left with one step. Now that's not what happens, it seems, as per ocean, in the oceans, in that these layers that have been observed seem to be very robust don't seem to change much. Right? So of course, the, so there's something missing. These are too simple in some sense, because they never pick out a scale. Yeah. Um, so this is a bit further on. So you can see there's been, there's been some merger of layers. Um, and these are very, these are very turbulent. Layers, nonetheless, and as time goes on, even more than they will merge. Oh, I'm sorry. Two times. Yeah. yeah. So this is the next time, and then they've merged to form these. And if we, <coughs> if we have the patience or computer time, whatever, I mean, eventually it would just be one step. That's kind of the end of the matter. So 
So these are what the profiles look like. Um, entropy gradient, P over rho gradient, and density gradient at those times. And you can see, you can see that there is a nice uh, step structure. In all the variables. And the turbulent fluxes, and they are very turbulent. So these are these are the vertical fluxes of temperature and salt, which are both positive because this is in the first quadrant. Okay, when you've got hot underneath, cold and salty underneath, fresh. So there are positive. And ever increasing. So, as the system evolves towards these layers, then the transport of heat and salt through the system just increases. And similarly, the entropy flux and the magnetic pressure flux. Um, these two, I'd say, why did these two look the same? It's not, not obvious. I've been arguing that. Temperature perturbation kind of comes from both salt, salt and temperature in this thermohaline pole. It's not obvious why this should really look like this much. This is the actual relation between them. It's more, and it turns out that temp in the turbulent system, it's the turbulent flux of temperature and salt is more or less the same. Okay, in a few minutes, let's talk about the other system. So this is now in the fourth quadrant. So this is the one that I've been saying is weird from a magnetic point of view, counterintuitive, counterintuitive even to have instability in that quadrant, I would say. Or, if you, or, you, or it's not weird once you've mapped it into the thermohaline. So this is first quadrant, thermohaline, fourth quadrant, magnetic bodies. And it does something similar. Um, those dashed lines are just the times in which I show these. This one is nicer in a way. The layer, there's more layers and they're less turbulent. Um, so this, this you can see how they're forming. They form somewhere. Um, there, there is no top and bottom here. So they just happen to form somewhere. And there's still, there's still homogeneous regions in between and that gradually fills out. Layers grow. Let's look at it. You have this, you have this really rather nice, beautiful layered state at the end. So this is this is an interesting feature, I would say. So something must look different in the magnetic plots, the thermohaline plots. So this is the. These are the temperature, salt, and density gradients for thermohaline convection. This run interpreted as thermohaline convection. Okay. So we're in the first quadrant. So the first quadrant is temperature gradient is destabilizing, which is why it starts off rest here. And the salt gradient is stabilized. Okay, and it forms these layers, these staircases. In the magnetic problems, <coughs> in the fourth quadrant, both of these have to be, both gradients are stabilized. So how the hell does it do anything? So how it does it is by forming backward steps. So you get very, you get very weak action here. So this bit, slightly backwards, isn't the overall gradient is quote stable, right? But in each of these subjects, it's a backward facing step. So it's unstable. How you get it, how why that why that works is because the magnetic field and the uh, entropy gradients are not independent. Not independent in a way that even in this stable, stable region, 
can get to it, it can configure itself into layers with backward facing steps. Again, the, the fluxes, the turbulent fluxes are forever increasing. I mean, this system could, this system, we stopped it more or less that time, just because they're so expensive. Lots of layer merging to go. So, why might we be bothered about the magnetic system, or where might it be of importance? It's only going to be of importance, really, in a kind of radiative zone. Start, say. And why it might be important is that. What people are really fussed about in, radi in modeling radiative zones is, is transport. It's a horrible problem because there's, there's so much going on. So much going on and nothing is dominant. In the convection zone, convection zone is convecting. That's your lot. You can say, well, there might be a bit of somebody else's instability, but no one really cares. Convection does it all for you and you're bothered about the transport of heat by convection. In radiative zones, there's a complete zoo of instabilities going on. It's not clear if anyone wins. And so this is all this. So this is adding to the zoo. It may not be a good thing to do, but it's adding to the zoo of things which might be important. And it's certainly feasible to be in the fourth quadrant in a radiative zone. So when I say there's a zoo, here's, here's, here's the picture from Jean Paul Zahn. This was his picture of the zoo. Um, these are all the things which kind of happen in a radiative zone. And it's, it's, it's very complicated. Um, and you can argue that in certain stars, something, bits of this zoo will be better than others. Um, and that might be true, but it is a very complicated problem. No, it, yeah, with no clear dominant mechanism. Um, apropos this particular magnetic buoyancy, there is um, there are papers talking about magnetic buoyancy as a means of mixing to explain observations. Giant branch and, and the asymptotic giant branch stars. Um, so what we have done as a has direct implications for what is said, for example, in that paper. Um, what should one do next? So this is very... So we have approached this as a thermohedron turned into magnetic buoyancy. So that relies on magnetobusinesque approximation and it relies on 2D motions. Otherwise, the analogy doesn't work. That doesn't mean it, it won't turn into layers. It just means the analogy doesn't work if you go beyond. So you can go beyond the analogy in lots of ways. So you could do, be, you could stay within the Boutonesque approximation and go 3D. Now, in thermohaline convection, 3D and 2D are quite different. They can be. Whereas in a magnetic problem, that's not. That won't be the case, one would imagine, because the magnetic problem has a strong field in one direction. So it imposes an isotropic system in a way that isn't there in the thermohaline component. So my feeling is that even if you did 3D instabilities, you would still get something similar because they don't look that different to 2D instabilities. Um, and then you can go beyond the Boussinesc approximation. Um, to either the full works or, or the analytic approximation. Um, and it's quite interesting, even, even explaining the instability within the analytic approximation is, is quite an interesting thing. I didn't say anything about this. Those of you who have looked at binary fluids, binary fluids can also be turned, you can also get to bind description of binary fluids from thermohaline convection by doing some things kind of similar to what we've done here. 
some sense that presumably <laughs> the layer comes first. Stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks, David.